Welcome. Finally, we had some technical difficulties there. Thank you for staying with us for uh, the seminar today. And uh, this is the first time we've had somebody live in a while here in the studio, as well as going remote. And that has led to some of the difficulties. But uh, we're we're really delighted. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Baek is here. And uh, without taking any more time away, we have a bio for her on the uh, seminar website. She has a long background in cybersecurity risk management in the financial sector for various companies and is author of an exciting new book that sometime soon <laughs> <laughs> will be uh, available from Wiley. Yes. And uh, on cybersecurity risk management. And that is what she's going to be talking to us about today. The title of her presentation is the title of the book. Yes. So please take it away and thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invite. And uh, I appreciate the people who came here in person. It's nice to do in-person things again. You need to have an audience too, not just the presenter. So as uh, Spouse said, I have been in cybersecurity for a long time. Uh, at uh, Early in my career at Price Waterhouse, I uh, learned that if you want to be seen as an expert in something, it's probably a good idea to be able to teach people how to succeed in that profession. So I've been uh, doing that all my life as well, uh, trying to put the best practices out there and gaining consensus. In doing so, picked up uh, a lot of uh, tools and techniques and uh, just working in cyber risk management in a variety of job functions later in, later in my career going into consulting and academia, focusing more on what really work in cybersecurity risk management and how to advise programs to be successful, really. So I've been doing that for the last four or five years. And the book that I wrote is really the culmination of that experience, trying to share that with you. So this talk is going to be the Cliff Notes version of the book. <laughs> More detail will be found in the book. So in the history of uh, risk, in the realm of risk management generally, cybersecurity is a fairly new idea. Uh, most people who joined the profession um, recently in the last couple of decades came in and there were already certification exams. There are already uh, big training programs and well-defined job functions. So it looked like a fairly mature profession. However, when some of us joined, joined the cybersecurity profession back when it was called computer security, then information security, um, enterprise risk management from the financial perspective didn't even include technology risk, much less cybersecurity risk. Now we have technology risk that's become pretty standard. Cybersecurity risk is just starting to join uh, enterprise programs for risk management. And when I put together how to explain what this cybersecurity risk realm was, I decided to call it a framework and I named it Frame Cyber. The word sometimes looks like I'm inventing some kind of new standard called Frame Cyber, but I'm not inventing a standard. We have really great standards out there. We've got many great standards. You know, the people at the National Institute of Technology, the people at the information or the um, International Standards Organization, the Center for Internet Security, they are publishing great things that we can use as tools and industry standards. What we don't have a lot of, and by the way, this is my favorite XKCD cartoon, so I'll give people a minute to read it. So, uh, yes. Uh, oops. These two. Okay. Those X's. Okay, because I see another box with a screen share that I can would like to get rid of as well. But um, okay. Um, hide video panel. Nope, that didn't work. Well, <laughs> okay. So frame cyber is not a new standard. It just simplifies cybersecurity risk management. One of the issues with cybersecurity risk management is people use standards in place of managing their own cybersecurity risk, figuring if they just follow the standard, that will take care of it. So the idea is that you know how to use standards and then you can focus on your risk profile. I define cybersecurity coming from a systems engineering background where when you're defining a system 
or the definition of a system itself, by the way, is uh, an assembly of components or parts that uh, have a specific function, operation, mission that cannot be found in any of the parts itself. It's a holistic concept of um, a method of arranging parts and components to get something bigger than the sum of the parts. And so in systems engineering, they also have a way to describe systems composed of parts that are pretty complicated or complex by breaking them down into what their mission is and then how the other components support the mission. It's called the systemogram. And in the systemogram, the system to be defined, it's just a label at the top and it stands at the top left corner of a diagram. And at the bottom corner, you have the system purpose or mission. And you take concepts and relationships between the concepts, nouns and verbs, to define the system itself by linking name to the mission. So the way Frame Cyber is defined is it empowers enterprises that oversee organizations to evaluate their cybersecurity risk to support their decisions. Simple definition, but in order to understand a complicated system, you need to supplement what we call the mainstay, the one sentence that really defines the purpose with other concepts that are included in the overall system that are needed to be understood in order to understand the missions, how the mission is accomplished. And in Frame Cyber, the most important thing to focus on is the threats. So Frame Cyber includes methods to catalog actors that threaten the enterprise. And events, cybersecurity attacks, incidents. They have losses, internal and external incidents. There are ways to use hypothetical incidents to present risk. An event that has happened internally has 100% probability, so it's risk realized. And the other events contribute to your ability to highlight vulnerabilities that allowed the event to occur that indicate risk. And so issues is another now, framework element, an element of the system of Frame Cyber. Risk um, tracking systems allow you to take those vulnerabilities, other compliance failures, come up with action plans that you can use to decrease the risk that are presented by the events that um, were caused or at least were enabled by the vulnerabilities. Another thing enterprises do to understand their risk is they take those good standards from places like NIST and ISO and they compare them to their own environment to identify where their environment doesn't include some kind of control requirement that the standards authors thought was necessary to reduce risk. And those standards may also end up as issues or the gaps from those standards will end up as issues. You get the gaps by taking your own controls, another framework element that sometimes the experts, uh, the enterprises dictate as policy, but the organizations that are running the operation will also have standards, procedures, automation, and those controls support the assessments. So where the controls map, the, map to the assessment requirements, you're meeting, or at least on paper, meeting the assessment requirements, and otherwise you may have issues. Of course, just having the controls doesn't mean that they're effective or working, so you measure your controls, among other things, to decide whether your risk is increasing or decreasing based on the level to which you can control the technology in your environment that is not ceding that control to the threat actors. And when um, the organizations establish these measures, they use them to maintain the controls, making sure the controls are actually operating properly and that they're effective. You can't do any of this without people. So you do have people as a framework element. You need people to uh, run the assessments, identify uh, the owners of the other framework elements, issues, events, risk indicators, managing the controls. And actors themselves are people that are part of this system. This allows enterprises to have the same information from an oversight perspective that the organizations have that are operating the technology for which the risk is being assessed. And so it gives them the ability to challenge and monitor those enterprises. 
we don't draw the whole system in a systemogram on the first slide because no one would understand it. But hopefully by breaking it down into these components, we get somewhat of an idea of what we mean by frame cyber. But now we'll go into each of the elements or most of them in a little bit more detail to give you a better appreciation. Cybersecurity threats are dangerous adversaries. They're nothing less than extremely dangerous adversaries. And we've known how to deal with dangerous adversaries since at least, you know, I don't know, 500 BC when Sun Tzu wrote The Art of War. If you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory you will gain, you will also suffer a defeat. <laughs> If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb to every battle. The whole idea is that the threat actors are out there. You need to know whether they're targeting you, how they're targeting you, what they want from you in order to know how to defend yourself. So we define what we mean by threats, threat intelligence specifically, because that's what we need to defend ourselves. Threats embolden adversaries who exploit vulnerabilities that expose assets that enable their objectives. They do this by selecting the enterprises as targets and analyzing their systems, then finding vulnerabilities in the systems, which they can exploit to expose assets that affect are, are affected by their subsequent activities once they exploit the vulnerability and expose the assets to enable their objectives. They take the money, they take the data, they disrupt the organization. And that's what we mean by threat intelligence. There are a lot of organizations that gather threat intelligence and share it in very systematic ways that allow enterprises to find out what threat actors are out there and whether they might be a target. So when you have gleaned that information, from those sources, and talk a little bit more about those in a minute, you should be creating your own threat catalog. You identify the threats, where they come from, what their tactics, skills, goals, resources. These are industry standard fields that are widely shared through uh, Department of Homeland Security and international information sharing and analysis centers. So much study has been done on these threat actors is that for that, these fields, you know, what their uh, purpose is, who they're targeting. You can create your own little algorithm to decide which ones are after you. First of all, are they active? You can get that from the Department of Homeland Security. If yes, do their objectives match what assets you have? Can they achieve their objectives by exposing your assets? Well, if they can, they fit your catalog. If yes, do capabilities that the actor has cover the systems, like if they can only, uh, if, or if they have a history of only attacking Windows systems and you're pure Linux, then you might put another threat actor higher in priority to prepare against in your catalog. But if they have the capabilities, then the next question is, do they have the resources or can you make it so strong and so tough that your defenses are not exceeded? That's always, um, a question, no matter how strong your defenses are, because technology changes so fast and there are zero day attacks, so it's hard to answer. So either way, when you get to this point, those those threat actors may or may, or may not be in your catalog, but if you find out that they've compromised a competitor, then that makes it a good candidate for your catalog. Where do we get this information? We get it from uh, federally funded research centers for the most part, like uh, MITRE. Um, and they have come up with a lot of different ways to map threat actor behavior and too many for me to cover, but this threat actor matrix is one of the best. It takes the steps, the, the a generic attack vector that a threat actor will use to get into your network, execute some vulnerability, persist, escalate their privileges, access things, discover more about the network once they're embedded, move around, collect data, execute commands, and then act on their objectives, which is exfiltrating data or getting money out of your uh, accounts. So they, they do this to facilitate pattern recognition, to help you better see in your own network 
where these types of steps may be executed within your environment. So we have um, many different steps in here that do exploits, for example. So wherever the uh, threat actor um, matrix says there's an exploit, if the threat actor that normally executes those types of exploits is after you, that, that is where in the process it will try to exploit that vulnerability. And so you, you can kind of use this to look at your own network and say, okay, if there is a, you know, a four-step uh, threat vector over here and a uh, five-step threat vector over here or six-step, then where should I be putting my defenses? And, and to lay it out more clearly, you would look at it from, you know, a step-by-step -step, um, activities of the threat actor. In this case, the threat actor steps are, are in uh, just a solid line and there are dashes where things happen based on what the uh, threat actor is doing. And looking at vectors this way helps you understand where in your network you could be vulnerable, even if you really don't think so at the outset. One of the things that people seem to ignore all the time is the widespread effectiveness of phishing attack where somebody just sends an email into your network and somebody clicks on it. So are you vulnerable to phishing attacks? How do you know that this attack vector will not harm you? The only way you can possibly know is to create a scenario where somebody in your environment, like maybe a business process owner, gets a malicious email and clicks on it. Even though he says, I'll never do that, you know, doesn't matter. Somebody in your business is going to. Statistically, it, it happens all the time. And you gather together all of the engineers and risk analysts and uh, the software application developers so you know how your software and how your network will react. And you uh, use the cybersecurity and internal audit people to challenge the uh, attendees to your scenario and come up with a, a method by which you can detect actually this happening. Can you analyze it? If, if you can't today, then you know you're going to probably have some losses from this event. If that happens, how would you recover? So you, you, you play act the event, you see what would happen and then what you might be able to do, or maybe that's a kind of a post-mortem, you figure out that later, because at the time you're just worried about what, what priority is it for us to do these things. So you put dollar figures to the things that would happen. If you lost all of your data in your file share, when could you get it back? How many hours would that be? How much overtime would you have to pay people? This is just the technology losses. There's also goodwill losses. Would you have to make customers whole for lost transactions, et cetera? But this gives a realistic portrayal of what might happen to you if you had a phishing attack. It's called a scenario event. When you, when you have that, it motivates people to implement more controls. And controls are management controls in any realm. Cybersecurity got most of its nomenclature on controls from first responders in the military. So we kind of think of controls as a cycle of trying to have um, regulations about what controls should be in place to prevent bad things from happening, simply prevent them. In the case of a firefighter first responder, it might be a lightning rod on every building. So you want that and you hope that it prevents the lightning from catching fire to the house. But some of them might not work very well or they might be have fallen off and the house gets on fire. What do you do then? You detect. You have some fire tower that looks at the smoke and starts alarming. It alarms not only the people in the house to get out, but also the first responders like the fire truck to come up and put the flames out. Now, in our original prevent, detect, respond in cybersecurity, that was it. We figured the event was over. It took us a while and many years to start refining that event. Like, um, you know, what if the house burns down? We have to recover it, right? What if we don't have the data anymore? So after various iterations of cycles in 2014, we ended up with the NIST CSF, cybersecurity framework. In addition to prevent, detect, and respond, we have identify. What is it out there that we have to know that you know, it might be vulnerable? How, what, how much technology runs our business? Where is it all? Then we protect it, then we detect it, then we respond to it. And when those responses fail, we recover. In, uh, in the first responders case, they don't have a recover because you know, they, they're not the ones to put the house back together. 
in the cybersecurity case, that, that also falls on us. And there are cases, however, where we don't recover, and that is what we're trying to prevent when we have a cybersecurity risk management program. And those controls themselves have a variety of uh, systemic uh, use cases. Um, I'm gonna point out here that controls enable management to achieve their goals to reduce risk. That's the whole idea behind risk appetite, policies, process, standards, procedures. And we'll look at each one of those. Tone at the top. This is a sample risk appetite statement. This is what somebody might say if they were trying to motivate their team to have a good attitude toward cybersecurity risk, and they have a low tolerance for vulnerabilities in their system. So this is what a CEO or a uh, uh, company president should be saying to everyone so that the cybersecurity program is known to be blessed by management and followed by management. There are several cases of cybersecurity incidents that were you know, blamed on uh, lack of governance, no tone at the top. Tone at the top is there whether you actually have a risk appetite or not. If you don't have a standard risk appetite that you're advising your people to uh, follow, then the tone at the top means nobody cares and nobody helps with the security program. So in addition to risk appetite and tone at the top, in order to take advantage of <laughs> the direction management has given us, uh, we write a policy. So our chief information security officer is usually tasked with this or the highest level um, person whose sole job is IT and they write out what you need to do to accomplish the goals of management for avoiding data breaches in this case. You know, no tolerance for data breaches, no tolerance for known vulnerabilities. You need a good sense of what's authorized use. And you set that down in policy among a variety, a large variety of other things. But from policy, you can say, especially with this least privilege, okay, who does what when it comes to policy? We have process for a least privileged uh, policy or process would be access control. Who do we involve? We involve human resources, we involve the uh, access administrators, we involve the managers who are hiring people in. We define job roles. We make sure that the job roles don't have more access. So we have security review of those. And this is a process because it is a workflow that involves multiple departments where each department may have their own way of executing their step in the joint process, and it achieves a policy objective. These documents build on each other, and underneath them, you have the technology that is used to enforce these controls automatically. Standards are directives for those technology configurations. Procedures are step-by-step -step instructions for people to follow that allow them to execute processes in real time and also to train others on how to do uh, those procedures and how to execute those controls. And they all have to be consistent with each other for any of them to work in, in order to achieve the objective that is set at tone of the top. So you just don't come up with procedures to meet your standard because they're the CIS procedures. You look at what the policy says and tune them to meet your management objectives. And then the cybersecurity standards themselves, I jumped ahead maybe by a thing, uh, have their own mainstay system definition. They include requirements that guide management to operate system security architecture that controls technology. These are not industry standards. They may be based on industry standards that are written by regulators, that are written by industry best practices organizations that we have already mentioned but each organization has their own set of requirements that is also dictated by their policy and their processes. And the technologists who are trying to build and maintain the, the system security architecture must take into account all the requirements, not just the standards, in order for it to be effective in their own environment. So when that occurs, um, we have the industry best practices maybe modeled in your system security architecture, as in this case of NIST, and 
the industry best practices may be providing the methodology by which you achieve your own security goals, but the method is your own method. In systems engineering, there's a difference between methodology, which is a set of tools and techniques, and the method is just how you have implemented it. In this case, we've used zero trust uh, technology as the example system security architecture. And the main tenant in zero trust is assume your network is compromised. And the NIST standard requires having a ton of controls at the network data user level, uh, application level to make sure that happens. It looks a little blurry because when you first look at one of those standards, it's really hard to figure out. But after really seeing how your policy and processes are supported by this technology, you end up saying, oh yeah, we do that. We have, we have the ISAC to do this piece. We have a policy engine with our single sign on over here. We have our active directory. These all are components of a system that have to be arranged in order to achieve the mission of cybersecurity. The components by themselves, without the thought into the architecture and the planning and the tone at the top and the procedures, will not work. This is a holistic method of achieving it. And that is the best thing I think that NIST has done uh, in this century so far. I'm sure they'll get better. <laughs> Here we have uh, an example procedure moving from standards to procedures. What we want to emphasize about procedures is that they have to be written for people who don't know what to do. Because in cybersecurity, half the time, the new people are left in front of a screen with a list of things that they have to accomplish. And if they don't have the detail to know the difference between a high priority and a low priority alert, they will miss an escalation. Um, if a new people come on the job and these procedures don't exist, you can't count on the people who know the procedures to be good teachers. So you have to have these documented and available in order for any of that other stuff to work. So we have policy, process, standard, and procedures. And I drill on this. I, this is an example quiz from one of my master's level classes because people take for granted that they know this and then they go writing a procedure that's more like a process that lets people make up what to do. So uh, your risk appetite uh, drives your policy and your policy says things that you, you and your management want to maintain as a management dictate. Your policy doesn't tell you how to do it. Your process says who's going to do it and kind of lays out the steps. Your standard says, okay, what technology are you going to use for what? And then your procedure is step by step how it gets done. There are your controls. Now, a CISO looking at this is constantly balancing what do I do? We have threats that um, don't always equal exploits. We have vulnerabilities that don't always equal exploits. But if you have vulnerabilities and threats together, you might have exploits because they would be allowed by the situation. If a threat actor wasn't after you that day, you might not have them, but if they were, then you will have them. And you need that prevent process to minimize exploits to which you are vulnerable. If you cannot uh, avoid them, you still need a detect process to find out uh, whether you have damage and to what extent you need to recover. So you need your detect and respond in addition to your prevent process to maintain a cybersecurity risk profile. They're not optional. You just don't say sit out there and prevent without using the other side of the NIST cycle. So this is what I call the CISO equation. It, it delineates the difference between cybersecurity incidents that happen all the time that might not affect you, a successful cyber attack, a realized risk, and a cyber loss event. And it tells you that you want to focus your priorities on the cyber loss events that have the highest level of damage and the highest probability of occurrence. When a CISO does assessments, they may outsource them, they may do them themselves, they may be handed them, but there are a wide variety of ways to do assessments and it's just all over the map. And, and it, they all, they're all called risk assessments, but many of them don't actually measure risk. They just measure controls or something else, but they give information. They indicate whether risk may or may not be present. 
an, a, an assessment objective may be something like a business process, which is usually called a self-assessment. It may be a map to something like how to maintain your operating system security, which is technology driven. Your scope may also just be technology driven. Do you, are you effective with your own architecture is a question that can be answered. Or are you uh, uh, mapping your processes or do you have the same processes that are recommended by the ISO standard? So that's a scope. The approach to an assessment can just be interviews, can just be asked questions, in which case they're not very valuable, but that is an approach that many people use. And the um, an approach could be as level, uh, as um, detailed level as penetration testing or other very technical tests for whether a control is effective. The result can just be, you know, is this vulnerable? Are we at risk? Yes or no. Or the result can be a very formally published audit report that goes to the board of directors. And in between, there are a wide variety of ways to do assessments. What they have in common is constraints, that all assessments take resources and they all have to be done by an assessor who is respected by the organization being assessed or they'll be dismissed and they won't get any information or evidence on which to base their assessment. So having an assessment is uh, a good thing, uh, but knowing where it comes from, how it was designed and whether it was accomplished effectively is also very important. And CISOs of course care uh, about all of it. Here's an example of assessment work papers. We have, uh, uh, this is a very formal example of how an auditor you know, that's really charged with getting things right all the time will organize their assessment. Well, they'll take every requirement, every, every line from an, from an assessment document that's published like the ISO or NIST assessments. They will have their own observations. They will list the people internally that they interviewed and talked to and got the evidence from. Then they will upload or cite the controls that they reviewed with maybe some testing results in the observations. They will, if they don't find evidence that the requirement is met, then they will cite a gap. Uh, in this case, the organization has planned to meet something, not yet. And in this case, they haven't met it yet. In both cases, the assessor will typically have a recommendation for how to use what you have internally or supplement it to meet the overall requirement of the assessment, which the CISO may or may not take, but at least they have an idea of what will fix it. The output of an assessment is not just the report then, or the set of work papers, but the set of what we call issues in cybersecurity when uh, a control requirement is not met. And the, the um, output will then be stored in an issue tracking system with the source of an assessment. These are some drop-down classifications for issue tracking. Issues are uh, tracked by type by the priority, by their status, by source. And you see the sources here are also events. You, you have a successful cyber attack, you find a vulnerability, then you create an issue and then you track it. So all of these go into the issue tracking system and then you might assign an organization that's responsible for remediating that issue. So then you can start to link those issues to actual risks and say, okay, this issue, uh, indicates that we may be more vulnerable to malware. Maybe our anti-malware system was broken during the assessment, right? So, so now we have where we are um, exposed to known exploited vulnerability and our malware risk is really high. And so then we know that's the thing we should probably work on first. But we, we prioritize our issues in order to uh, track them to full remediation. And when we do this as a risk indicator, We'll do it over time. How many issues do we have today? Do we have targets for all our issues? When are they supposed to be due? How many took to, you know, how long did they take to resolve, right? So trends and security risk issues, how many do we have that are critical on an ongoing basis? If we've got a lot of critical all the time, that's a real problem, you know, depending on how we've defined critical, of course. But that's all part of your holistic security program. Now, uh, as we mentioned, um, indicators can come from a lot of different places and most people use vulnerabilities as indicators. So I'm gonna give an example of how somebody creates a metric 
for a vulnerability risk indicator. In this example, they've taken all of the machines in their data center and they've labeled them with an, a nominal measure, which is just a label. Do they have PII on them? And then they've taken an ordinal measure, which is a uh, just an ordered list and said, are the vulnerabilities on them high, medium, or low? And then uh, we know that they are, uh, there, there are 11 in the scope of our assessment or our, our measure. We filter by PII as part of our metric algorithm. Now we've taken the measures, now we're doing our metric, and we find we have eight that have personally identifiable information on them. And then we prioritize them by the vulnerability label. So we have high vulnerabilities. We have six PII with high vulnerabilities. We try to patch all six. That's our control. That's our process. Uh-oh. Two of them are still PII with high vulnerabilities after we scan again. That means there's something wrong with either the way we're measuring vulnerabilities or the way we're patching. And so we use that as a risk indicator. where We want 100%. We've got 66%. And over time, we chart how we're doing with that patching, our success rate, to see if we're getting better or worse. If you're always getting worse, either you don't know how to do metrics or you don't know how to patch. Those are the only two choices. <laughs> so we have um, other metrics that are in frequent use and really to very good um, ends or very informative uses, let's put it that way. I, I always say, you know, good metrics sometimes give you bad news. So <laughs> this, in this case, we're seeing incident timeline by severity and source. So our incidents are, met, are, are rated as high, medium, and low, the priority in which they came in, and the source of where they came from, the anti-malware system. These are all parts of our, uh, cyber, our system security architecture. And the dates are how long, how many days this was open. In the first quarter, it looks like this one was open like over a month. This one may be a week. This one may be a day. So we're looking at the number and type of our incidents over time by severity and saying, hey, this one was really long. So maybe we got a little better at processing critical incidents. And so they're, they're getting shorter over here. And then we're not getting too many anymore, but we're really spending more time on them. But as we're getting better at these critical incidents, look, at the time to close of our log monitoring incidents, which we consider lower priority than the critical incidents, are, are not getting closed. What's the risk in that? What do we miss by not looking at our logs as opposed to these automated anomaly detection alerts. Well, what you miss when you're not looking at log alerts, you miss the people trying to stay under the radar of high priority alerts. So this is actually an indication that your advanced persistent threat risk may be increasing because you're not responding very well to your log monitors. So when you take that information and you try to make a metric out of it in the uh, context of risk, you want to start with your risk appetite. What is your risk appetite for advanced persistent threat? Well, we don't want any data breaches. You know, this is what we're hearing, and we don't want any uh, uh, um, cybersecurity uh, known vulnerabilities. So, let's just say, as as the um, metrics program uh, evolves to uh, uh, take individual uh, metrics based on individual risks that will put a, risk, a, a threshold, a time threshold on what we mean by an adequate um, time to, de to detect an, an advanced persistent threat before we actually could experience real harm. So if we had you know, the nation states in our network and they stayed for more than 24 hours, we know that we could possibly lose some kind of end of day process or um, midday process or some kind of operational target that would put us at very high risk for further damage. So if we don't catch it in that time frame, we have a problem. So that is uh, that then we would put our uh, risk appetite threshold much lower than our capacity, much lower than so that we have time if we miss our threshold to really uh, fix getting to it within 24 hours. And then you chart your actual time to close cybersecurity incidents in that um, same scale. Let me 
missing the mouse anymore? Okay. Um, in the same scale. So we are not, um, there we go. So if we're climbing up closer to the time to close incidents within our risk appetite, that means that we should be really thinking about how, how to make that trend go the other way. If it's trending up and we're not doing anything, the trend is going to continue. And that's how metrics help. So we take our risk hierarchy and we have the advanced persistent threat risk here. And we said that we're measuring it this way. But when we look at our overall risk hierarchy, we see, oh, you know what? There's a higher uh, vulnerability that we don't have this measure for right now. We have this known exploited vulnerabilities and we already know that we broke it because we had that event. So we're way above our remediation target on a tolerance measure for this known exploited vulnerability. And you know what that does? It makes our entire cybersecurity risk 100%. Because at the top level, at the enterprise um, risk framework level, that cybersecurity risk just became the highest one that we have, right? Because risks bubble up. You don't measure risks at the bottom and say it's the average. If there's an 80% risk of a known exploited vulnerability, that means there's an 80% risk of a cyber attack. It, it just goes up. So when you take those metrics and you put them in the context of um, a visual risk hierarchy, you get this cybersecurity um, picture where you can know like, okay, so you're not all that vulnerable to web defacement, to denial of service, but this quantitative ma manipulation thing is one of our biggest problems. And so it, it helps you decide how to prioritize uh, and figure out how to manage your cybersecurity risk. Now, uh, the, um, Obviously, not everybody does this, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Obviously, this is risk management 101, but it's not cybersecurity 101. So what we're trying to uh, focus on here is how we can use these risk management principles productively, and I have seen them used very productively in this context, right? So uh, in order to um, uh, make cybersecurity risk visible and cybersecurity risk management visible, I've included a lot of visualizations in this presentation. But like you know, any effort for transparency, it requires clearing out a lot of clouds, right? There are a lot of cloud, clouded thinking about what is important to do and why that have nothing to do with measuring your cybersecurity risk. And for that, uh, I refer you to Spaff's book on myths and misconceptions in cybersecurity. Thank you. Mike, if you want to, if there are any questions online, you want to read them? Yeah, you should mind. That's the button. Are there any online? No. Anybody in the I think so. Like this one. Um, is this out of okay? Um, so a bit more on the last thing that you just said on clouded thinking. Um, sometimes the fear is that there's too much, there's too much to think about, and it's changing too quickly to think about it all and still be right. And I wonder if something like uh, Frame Cyber would help with that, where it's not just that I understood how these like ISO standards work and how frame cyber works, but in the future as well, I have the tools to keep up with it, even though um, it's spreading like quite wide. Yes, the, uh, the, the, the key is the preparation part to have that plan, your risk management plan that includes all of your policies, procedures. If you haven't done that, then you're playing catch up to start with. And for a new cybersecurity program, especially it's, it's um, typically the case that you do need to do a lot of assessments to figure out the gaps between the technology that you have and what you would like to see as your system security architecture. 
because you're always coming in at some mid-level where somebody has implemented some things that you think work. But without the exercise of taking the top level um, tone at the top through policy, process, and procedure, you cannot make the determination. So if you're at that stage, you're in a state of confusion and you need to build that documentation set and share it and train everyone on it first before you can deal with the day-to-day -day challenges of um, you know, swatting the flies away as they come hitting your windshield. So um, there is always the, the catch-up game. And I, I admit that's a very big project. But the way I've seen people deal with that is create a team to do that while the security operations center is putting out fires, right? The security operations center may be honing their firefighting procedures and you may succumb to a lot of cyber attacks. But if you do it with your eyes wide open and you know why, you won't go to jail as a CISO for hiding it. <laughs> so I'll make, I'll make an observation, which is <clears throat> you presented a really comprehensive look at managing cybersecurity risk and operations. Um, what I think is important, certainly for some of the audience to recognize is at the next level up, the CEO level or the board level, you're also putting in there opportunity cost, market movement, uh, and other aspects so that dollars are limited if or euros or whatever. And you have to balance the risk versus the opportunity for the investment, progression of new products, opening new markets, or retrenchment of markets. Um, and that also plays a factor here that is not captured by a cybersecurity standard but has to be a part of the decision process. Yes, and that is where you have to take that risk appetite and, and be very careful about where you put your risk capacity threshold. Because neither, no matter what um, uh, someone decides they can afford or not when it comes to a cybersecurity control, if they haven't figured out what's gonna put them out of business as far as cybersecurity attacks go, then they don't have anything to compare it to. So when I, I that um, putting that um, APT risk appetite um, capacity line is where you need to have that agreement with tone at the top. And if you do that and your board of directors agrees because all of these things get presented at the board level, even if they don't read every slide, they get the packet, okay? And to that extent where they know that you are not gonna hit that 24 hour, you've changed it to 48 hours, that's your call. You can't afford it, you're not going to do it, but it's in your metric. That's what you're holding yourself to. If you just don't hold yourself to anything because you say, oh, we can't afford any of this, then you're not actually running a, a, a industry standard cybersecurity program. Right, now part of this is that there are no industry standards for cybersecurity programs other you know, than advice, they're not um, legally binding, as they are in many other areas of engineering. Software engineering itself doesn't have any legally binding standards that you need to follow to develop software. You don't need to be an apprentice for many years. You don't need to get a professional license, and you have no safety standards, okay? <laughs> These don't exist for software generally, so they don't exist for cybersecurity either. So until we get that kind of level of control over technology as a society, uh, where we are going to have to deal with every individual risk appetite tone at the top, but as cybersecurity professionals, we can deal with that as long as we're aware of what it is. Any other questions? Um, so within frame cyber or risk management more broadly, how significant of a role do you say compliances like SOC 2 play? Uh, it is a uh, a useful rule, uh, a, a ruler in the metrics rule set, you know, that you can pass a regulatory exam, that you didn't ignore it, that you understand that you are regulated, and, and that uh, there are requirements that your customers expect you to have in the, in the case of SOC. So, uh, but it is probably the lowest form of risk assessment because you're, you're paying a... Uh, uh, some kind of firm to do a service for you to give a report to your customers. And the SOC that Marriott gave to their 
customers and investors was completely clean right before their cyber attack. <laughs> you know, they, it was a it was a horrific attack. Very very lots of PII exposed. You know, lots of lawsuits and stuff coming out of it. But um, their sock was clean. So it's 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 I, I won't I I won't say it's paper pushing, but that's why security gets the uh, reputation for paper pushing. <laughs> I'll just add the comment that we don't, we can't measure what we don't know. And, and so anybody working in this field or really pretty much any field should, should realize that all the controls and methods we put in place are for the things that we know how to control and measure. And, and so it's those unknowns that sometimes uh, cause us the most heartache. And that's, that's where having, more generalized recovery plans, which you know about, you didn't really include in here, but are part of this, that have to be part of the overall picture. So it's- Oh, I included it. It was part of the NIST standard and part of the prevent, detect, yes. recover, or, or respond. But um, we added recover in cybersecurity on purpose because or, respond is not enough, obviously. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's that's uh, why, you know, everybody in cybersecurity just took a deep breath of relief when that NIST standard came out. And we're really looking forward to version two as well with supplier supply risk supplier risk management and governance. Mm -hmm. and then when we add privacy, oh yeah. <laughs> well. Mm -hmm. So with regards to risk appetite, and um, if you go back a couple slides, we talked about uh, you know the risk appetite where um, we had a capacity for you know metrics of sort of percentage breakdown of you know what can be acceptable risk before it's too late, sort of that 100%. Yeah. You know, are there other ways of, of quantifying besides the obvious you know, dollar sign of, oh, this is the risk, or this is the potential result of a risk um, going wrong? You know, are, are there other ways of quantifying that than, than a dollar sign that says, oh, downtime will cost us this? Well, there, there are many ways of quantifying that don't have to do with dollar signs, and they usually have got to do with um, uh, yeah, um, loss avoidance, like um, uh, the the number of possible operations that we didn't do because, or we didn't um, uh, uh, deliver product because we uh, had to deal with this cyber attack. So there are operational um, negative impact statements that sometimes people can't put a dollar amount exactly to, but they know it is uh, something that could put them out of business. Another one is regulatory compliance. FTX didn't go out of business because, uh, I mean, they, they went out of business because they lost a lot of money, of course. But what uh, uh, really uh, is, okay, so FTX did go out of business because they lost money. But other crypto exchanges um, went out of business because they didn't meet regulations. Okay, so think about going out of business because the government shuts you down. That's not a dollar assignment, but you can look at the regulations and say, if we don't do this, we will get shut down. Therefore, we need to do it. And that can be your high bar for your 24 hours. It would be every day we need to test that we're doing this. And if our tests fail, or if our tests start to, you know, our failure rate starts to get to our risk appetite, we better stop and do that because we'll get shut down. So there are other things that can happen that are neg uh, negative effects that can wipe out an enterprise. And, and those are just as good as monetary losses to measure. Yeah. yeah two questions from online. Uh, first from Andrew. How do you recommend organizations, especially those with limited resources, develop and maintain an effective threat intelligence program to stay ahead of rapidly involve, rapidly evolving cyber threats? I would say join your FSISAC your, and any local community, um, uh, industry associations like FIRST or you know, it's one of those um, organizations that get together and share threat activity because you want to be in a group with people in your industry who are experiencing um, the same types of threats that you can be expected 
to uh, experience. So when you talk about the level of effort for threat intelligence, it's it's almost negligible because if you are in a, a data feed with an FSI SAC and you can see which companies were um, <clears throat> impacted by uh, size and <clears throat> technology type, you can use that little algorithm we talked about and and say, okay, these are these are the two or three threat actors that are active today that just got my competitor. Let's focus on those, right? Um, so that is, uh, there's so much information out there now that it's not the hardest thing. And everything that we put in this uh, threat actor, uh, okay, <laughs> where was that? Okay. So, right, everything we put in this threat actor catalog entry is available through those forums. Um, right, so, and once you have chosen the two or three that you know are out there and, and impacting your industry buddies, then you just, Google them and do a little extra research just to make sure that, that you've looked at all of their skills and techniques and what's been successful. And then when you do this equation, you'll end up with at least you know, five or six. It doesn't have to be uh, hundreds and, and thousands like it might be in, in for Chase Manhattan Bank. You know, It can be five or six. If, if you don't have phishing, ransomware, and SQL injection on that list, then you need to add those. <laughs> but anything else should come from what uh, your uh, industry, uh, people in your industry uh, are charting officially. Okay, and uh, second question, it's pretty similar to the other question. This is also from a different Andrew. Um, the general attitude is organizations uh, is we have apps in place that handle X, so we're covered. App Sprawl is giving a false sense of security. What have you found is the best way to get organizations to start thinking differently about cyber risk and cyber defense? Do an assessment against the NIST Zero Trust Standards, right? Because um, if you, if, what, the types of things that it says that you should be doing in order to, uh, not be vulnerable to the threats that we know are attacking us at the nation state level, practically every company in the US, are things like have a way to detect when your controls fail. Okay, so some people have X apps. What happens when they fail? Do you get an alert when your, uh, um, uh, you know, CrowdStrike fails? You, know, <laughs> you probably didn't configure that one, <laughs> right? So. People don't have effectiveness measures for their own cybersecurity controls. And so they can't rely on them unless one, they know that they're part of this of something that's going to accomplish holistically that you are at least following the tenets of zero trust, which means a bad person could be on your network attacking you and you would find out. Okay. Trust no one. It means if somebody's on your network, they can't be trusted either. So you're supposed to have enough detection to know when things don't go the way you planned. The only way you can do that is to have a plan and know that you can measure when it goes awry. So you have or awry, whatever. The um, the plan for data uh, data flow from one app to another, right? Now. The, the easiest thing to know when you've got an intruder in your midst is if you know your application shares data with the database and the uh, the the VDI uh, uh, you know VR console right that's where your users are it should hit the database it should hit the server if that app communicates with any other point on the network you have a problem right so that is, that is the type of surveillance that you should be doing for your security controls to know that they're in place. And if you design a zero trust architecture and can monitor that, then, um, then you will have achieved uh, what, what is now considered 
you know, best practices in cybersecurity programs. But if you rely on a bunch of apps without that context, nobody, no auditor can come in and figure out why you think you're secure because you don't have the, the whole program around it where, where everybody's on the same page and they know when things go wrong. Good point for us to wrap up and say okay. again, thank you so much. I'll say here, that's a good point to wrap up and thank you so much. And um, do we have a link to her book page on the, her bio? Yes. All right. And so keep an eye out for that. That should be out a little bit later this year if you want to pursue this topic further. And thank you very much for coming. We'll have another speaker next week. Thank you.